And now, I would like to uh, call upon Dr. Paul Hedges from Nanyang Technology University, or what the locals know as NTU for short, to give his presentation titled, What Kind of Dialogue Is There Between Atheists and Religious People? Doctor? <coughs> Okay, thank you very much, AJ, and very glad to be here, and also good to see such a good and international and diverse audience. Um, it's been a little while since I've engaged with Humanist Society here, they were of course very busy, um, but it was back in 2016, um, I had a book out um, entitled Actually Religion and Atheism in Dialogue, the title Towards Better Disagreement, um, and we did book launch with them to discuss some of the ideas um, in there, which was great. So, I have my corporate branding up here, so I can get started. Um, so I've spilled a little bit of terminology, you've been an academic, what have you been talking about, what is an atheist, um, what is a religious person. Um, and also say a little bit about what we mean by dialogue, how I'm going to be using that term um, today. I'll then talk a little bit about some of the dialogical and non-dialogical encounters, so what actually happens um, when these various groups or those we see as part of these groups meet and talk together, and also say something about Singapore's context as well, as to how some of this works out here. Um, so firstly, what is an atheist? Um, now, of course, being a humanist and an atheist is not the same thing. Lots of humanists may not be atheists. Many atheists are not humanists, but um, I'll leave that aside for the moment. But at least, of course, it basically means a non-theist. And particularly in Asia, this raises all sorts of questions. Um, it's, of course, the classic Asian non-theist is, is the Buddhist. They don't believe in Atman, if you like this term, literally itself, but really sort of soul, at the time they were sort of rising to it about half a thousand years ago. Um, of course, they didn't deny deities, but deities are just part of like, the world sort of system um, in which we live. I'll leave that for a second. Um, but of course, today, we normally see them when they get classified as part of the religious creed. They seem to have this belief sort of in the spiritual or supernatural in some way. So normally by atheists, we don't just mean denial of a god or a personal god, which of course is literally what it means. Um, we mean someone who denies a, a supernatural world, sort of the Pegasus, and this whole thing from, of course, in Western context, through David, through Nietzsche, and also sort of leading up to how we would see this. So of course, common reincarnation is often seen as something that makes not an atheist as we use this term. Um, but I just might have a note there, um, what Andrew has just mentioned, sort of secularism, and of course in the 18th century, when secularism was rising in the West, a lot of inspiration came from the Buddha and Confucius, who were seen at that time as atheist thinkers, people who didn't need a personal God to ground their worldview, to ground their morality. Um, but of course, both of them have what we might call very religious um, worldviews, Confucius' notion of Tien, um, sort of the Buddha in these ideas of sort of karma and rebirth, and reincarnation. So sometimes what we mean by an atheist, what we mean by a, uh, a religious person, gets confused there. Um, also there's another group, and I'll come back to these when I talk about Singapore, but the non-religious. And of course increasingly, um, globally we see this rise of people who are non-religious. Um, but if you like, in as far as they've been studied, there's a lot of studies going on now, often, most are not atheists. There's at least 20% of them in Singapore at the moment. Um, but they seem to engage with all sorts of things we might see as spirit, job, or religious worldview. So I'll come back and talk about, more about this um, in this context as we go on. So you think you've got some sense of what an atheist says. Now, a religious person. Now, we've had some mention over here sort of um, Dawkins and Hitchens, and of course, if you listen to them, religious people are completely irrational and crazy and weird people, um, as opposed to the rational, saying atheists. Um, on the other side, this of course is not, if you like, a useful category. It also is a problem, is of course, if somebody converts from being religious to being an atheist, have they stopped being a crazy national person? So if they're crazy national, how did they get to the other side? Um, again, if we look sort of through history, most of the philosophers, the scientists that we see around us throughout world history have been religious. Clearly, they've been incredibly national um, and religious work together. So there's a lot of, if you like, sort of polemic um, on both sides of this debate. Um, particularly stereotyping. 
Um, and of course, there's so many people in Singapore who think that Judas and atheists are basically as if you're not an evil people who will go and murder their grandmother to take it for benefit them. So we see this sort of stereotyping going back and forth both ways. I put a final question here what is religion? Um, I could spend the rest of this morning lecturing you on the problems of this term. It's basically it's a modern Western category. Before about 200 years ago, we simply could not use this term in the way we use it today to talk about a range of different traditions and what is religious, what is not religious. This has sort of gone back and forth over the ages, depending upon what gets accounted and what doesn't get accounted. But I'm just leave that there because if you don't actually know what religion is, then of course you can a religious person also becomes dogmatic. So, on to dialogue. Um, I thought I'd give a privilege for the discursive communication. I put a question mark there. Um, but in lots of fields, in philosophy, in education, um, this whole field of, sort of dialogue studies itself, it often means some special form of communication, which is often different from debate and confrontation. So, it's about people seeking to understand each other, have empathy towards each other, and that's kind of what I'm going to be quite used to certain dialogue today. If I talk about people in dialogue, there's an attempt to understand non dialogical communication is if you like people chanting and screaming at each other and not really listening to what the other person has got to say. Um, again, as an academic, I could stand here for a couple of hours and talk about dialogue and its history and Plato writing dialogues and what that means, but um, I won't because we have other speakers coming on too. Um, so the teaching, if I can convince ourselves, is into religious dialogue. Now, I'm going to use my distinction here. There's many different ways to categorize this, but something that's useful for us is from a Norwegian scholar of Bjorn Lervik, um, who's distinguished between what he calls spiritual dialogues, which are those that people want to take each other for existential sort of purposes to see meaning in the world. What does this other person think? Can I go through my spirituality by talking to them? And then necessary dialogues, which is what I don't necessarily want to learn from the other person, but we have to live alongside each other. Um, so in places like sort of um, the Balkans, also locally in the and the Lockers, if you like, so particularly sort of Muslims and Christians have had to engage in dialogue because there's been war and conflict going on. You need sort of peace there. And of course in Singapore, a lot of the focus upon interreligious dialogue is simply about social cohesion. How do we coexist without the communities coming um, to arms with one another? Now, of course, the question is whether this involves atheists. Can an atheist be involved in interreligious dialogue? Again, we can put in religion is. Um, increasingly, people talk about interworldview dialogue uh, as a way to describe this, as a sort of literature talking about this. It's quite a cumbersome term in various ways, but I'm yet to see if I could better term. Um, the least in particular is talking about some ideas, and of course, lots of people don't actually think about what they do, they just have practice, so beliefs aren't necessarily accurate. Um, so, I must have spoken about interworldview dialogue. Um, so, he was going to talk more about this particularly, so I'm not going to then go into this length, so I'll just leave that there. So, on to the next point. What happens when these atheists, whether they may be in religious people, whether they may be get together? On the one side, we see non dialogical encounters. Um, and just to stay here, I've of course I've come Dawkins here as a sort of classic case of someone who likes to shout and rant a little bit. There may, of course, be great Dawkins um, enthusiasts here in the room, and I don't want to upset you, but you know, he's not someone who minces his words. When he wants to attack people, he attacks them and he goes full out into this. So there's a lot of this out there. If you're not aware of the literature or stuff, I'm sure you are, just go online onto YouTube, put in Christian and Atheist, and you'll find all sorts of polemics um, to keep your fill. But there are also dialogues, there's much more intentional reasons where people are seeking to understand. Um, and I'd also suggest that you find this new atheist way that we see, um, which was really the 90s to the early 2000s, and it's four horsemen, so Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, and Dennett. Um, so we've had a lot of polemic. You know, we've now seen a much more moderate face of uh, atheist sort of uh, um, debate, and also on the religious side, people are willing to talk to these people without simply sort of coming back um, with you know their own sort of rhetoric and polemic um, on the other side. Of course, the other stuff is still going on. Again, just go onto YouTube and find all sorts of people still engaged in these. I wouldn't say old-fashioned debates, but perhaps no longer the sort of main current debates. Um, so the new generation of books and encounters seems to encapsulate this. 
I won't mention too much now, but my last slides have been basically reading this. Um, and most of the books I've seen coming out now are from 2012. There's a book called Faith Years, that some of you may know. Academic books coming out. Um, but Peter Adamant, who's in Ireland, who is a Christian, has written a book about atheists, and they're talking back and forth, seeking dialogue and counsel. So there's a very different um, world sort of going on. So I think we see dialogues as into a worldview dialogue. Now, there's also a necessary dialogue. So getting back to my point about what we also observe it, even if people don't want to understand each other, there's an awful lot that goes on where sort of atheists, humanists, people with no religion find they have a lot of common ground with the religious groups in various ways. Um, so put it here sort of social cohesion work. Um, and of course in civil war it becomes a part of sort of what we do here, um, but also globally, um, people are worried about racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and of course there's a certain amount of Islamophobia that's in that new HDS tradition. Um, Sam Harris fits the classic definition of Islamophobe, Dawkins often says stuff that looks deeply deeply Islamophobic, and then lots of atheists are deeply worried about the way these people speak. How do you attack these, you know, these people that people sometimes need to work with? Um, anti-Semitism, of course, comes in at times as well. So areas, of course, ecology and environment, which is a huge sort of thing today. Um, and from sort of all sorts of global campaigns, you know, to clean up, uh, up the beaches, um, to bigger sort of international sort of events, um, we see these people coming together. And particularly after the um, Pope Francis, like, oh, hey, sir, his big sort of encyclical on the environment, I think people have started to see that actually, you know, there's a lot of religious people, on the Catholic side, very much concerned about the environment, atheist, humanist, concerned about this, and they've got a lot of sort of global movements of bringing people together, um, to work together. Um, and again, I think it's a peace building, so sort of here, how to work with your neighbours. Um, and I'm literally from the UK, I've been in Singapore for 10 years now, but of course I'm there originally. Um, and of course, in the last few months, we've seen sort of those major riots um, across the streets, and it's like encounter protests coming out against the riots, we see a very mixed sort of bunch of people. Um, you know, of course, it's not just sort of Muslims complaining, but Muslims, Christians, atheists, Hindus, all sorts of people coming together to say, you know, this is not the way we sort of treat our neighbours. And again, globally, we'll see very similar sort of things. And again, particularly the growth of sort of non religious sort of demographic across many countries that you were from is possibly the majority now, but say 20% here. Um, of course, much of you of the rest of the world, at least sort of 50% we're looking at, um, who are non religious in various ways. So, if, like, if religious people just simply want to sit in their own little box and talk across the people, huge parts of the population not being talked to. Um, and again, this is of the the world, your dialogue is a recognition um, of this. Um, and actually, last uh, year here in Singapore, my program, we put on a, a, a event and executive program, so really for sort of um, uh, our sort of civil servants who sort of deal with sort of social cohesion questions, um, the educators in the schools, people in religious organisations and faith organisations, how do you get into non religion? What is non religion? Who are dysdemocratic? How do you talk to them? And again, this is increasingly something again, it's not just atheists and humanists want to talk to the religious groups. The religious groups increasingly understand they have to talk effectively to the other groups as well. So we're coming into this Singapore context. So are there dialogues? Um, so the answer yes. The fact that of course that um, various sort of people from religious organisations have been invited here to the group to um, do that to that fact. Um, but yes, I mean the humanists do this. Um, they're involved in the ask me anything. I'm not sure if it's an official one, but for about five six years, if I just ask me anything, um, movement has been going on in Singapore, particularly sort of youth sort of led. Where I let the political come to stay, the people just can ask them anything they want. Um, there's also the issue this one of these done as well. So this is going back and forth. Um, as many of you may know, the issue this society here has got an interfaith guide. If you go online to the Singapore um, interfaith thing, there's an interfaith guidebook on there. Um, so it'll give you a guide to this. Um, and again, there's Singapore's context that goes here, harmony, cohesion, um, in inverted commas, because all sorts of ways you can be suspicious of these terms and the way certain parties seek to use them. I won't say government because I don't want to get into trouble. I'm technically a civil servant, being tenured academically, so I won't mention them. But again, this is all part of it. MRHA stands for, I don't know if any of our 
Following yes, yet no, to the means of the religious arm in the act, um, and we're asking now to hurt the sentiments of the Nazi community, um, which of course has all sorts of effects. Part of it, of course, is the interreligious thing. So when you sort of particularly evangelical Christians who like to be very enthusiastic to persuade people to join them, go out, they can say some really sort of nasty things about other traditions. And that's something sort of Singapore does not allow. Um, partly there's a history of racial bias, the information should be into the uh, harmony diversity gallery, and it's like those riots of the 50s and 60s, it's still something repeated sort of here as part of this sort of living sort of memory. We have to keep sort of uh, this coexistence between the communities. And of course, this also means that figures like Dawkins would not be welcome in Singapore sort of with his kind of ground um, of, of speaking, if I put it that way. Um, also, I mentioned this is 20% of the non-religious here. It's much higher amongst the, uh, the young group. I can't remember the figures off the top of my head. Um, but certainly, one time the next census comes out, um, we'll probably see it, perhaps 40, maybe 50% of like, the youngest demographic looking into this non-religious group. Now, there aren't any detailed studies here yet. I said they're not globally. Um, in the UK, as has been done, in the US has been done, there's also a team that has been doing like, quite a big international study of sort of non-religious um, groups. Um, but I said many people that we sort of look at here who say they're non-religious engage in also what you might see as religious. So particularly the Chinese communities, ancestral veneration is something that you do. You're expected to sort of pay your respects to the ancestors of the tablets of your ancestors, you like the incense, you bow down. And people are doing this. Now, what that means, of course, can differ greatly for many people. Um, you could be worshipping them as ancestors in some realm who could benefit you, or you could simply be paying respects. You know, just as you pay respects to your parents and very sort of um, Chinese and Asian cultures, you pay respects to your other descendants. And of course, all sorts of different interpretations amongst different communities worldwide as to whether this is something religious or cultural. Um, they practice it fairly a lot. Um, also, in this non-religious group, um, I've mentioned this problematic term religion. And again, in this part of the world, because the whole Semitic sort of Chinese world, of which effectively we are part of to some degree, people never belonged to a religion. Because one, they didn't have a term for it, but also it just engaged in what is useful for you. So, go a few hundred years back in China, um, you're some sort of, you're sort of villager, now, if you need a funeral, you go to the Buddhists. Buddhists are good at funerals. Um, you need an exorcism, you go to discuss your master's Taoists because they're the experts at that. Your social norms, again, Confucianism, is going to define some of your topics of behavior and your morality um, within this. And you'll let your village shrine, any continent, priest, or shaman, yet you always get them in to come and do it. You have no sense of belonging to a tradition. Um, and of course, this is still seen in Japan. Because depending on what questions you ask, it's either the most or the least religious country in the world. So if you ask people if they belong to a religion, even if they go to the shrines that they know they belong, because they think belong means being a monk. So it's basically only Christians and members of the universe who say yes, but then if you ask them what have you done recently, be the shrines, be the incense, then the average Japanese person belongs to 2.8 religions. Which of course is quite high. But in this context, it makes perfect sense because, you know, fact, as I said, sort of in this strategic religious participation, you just do whatever is used for the time. Um, and some of you may go, there's a place on Bugis, quite near here, there's a very famous temple of Guan Yin, um, <coughs> who I could say is a Buddhist bodhisattva, she's also a Chinese goddess, it's kind of complicated as to what exactly she is, but her temple is there. There's a Hindu temple further down, there's a sort of Catholic church a bit further, and people are walking past, go round one, round the next, round the next, you pay your respects to all of these different things, because you who knows which one's right? Maybe they're not right. You just have to sort of take this off to speak in various ways. So again, with this, as an important sign of atheism, tradition, and religion in grey areas, we have mentioned Confucianism. Here is the respect of it as a philosophy. It should cross into Indonesia, it's one of their religions, it's a religion in Hong Kong. Um, there's certainly sort of very atheistic trends, figures like Shunzo, if you know your sort of Confucian philosophy, deeply sort of, you know, there's nothing out there. It's like, if you pray and it rains, it's going to rain anyway, you know. 
does it have no effect, but there's also a deeply sort of spiritual, sort of mystical, and sometimes quasi-theistic part of Confucianism as well. So, you know, in this local area, what people are doing, why they're doing it, it's very hard to always determine who's the religious, who is the atheist in this context. And just to finish, as promised, the picture was reading this for you here, um, but I'm happy to have these slides. So if you want to know more about the different kinds of dialogue, what dialogue is, religious atheist dialogue, interworldly dialogue, and some of the important context for you here. So just see what you're interested in out of this huge mix. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, by the way, if anyone wants to see the speaker's bios, it's actually in the website of Humanist Society of Singapore. I'm actually trying to speed things up so that we can have a very interesting and more time for the panel discussion. 